I'm sure more people will be joining us. Uh, and Katie started with the recording, so that's good. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Penelope Adams Moon. I direct UW Center for Teaching and Learning, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2022 Teaching and Learning Symposium. I am very excited uh, to introduce our keynote speaker this year, but before I do that, I want to speak briefly about this year's theme, Humanized Teaching in Uncertain Times. It's, it's no surprise we've all been through a lot these last couple of years. Uh, even those of us who felt like we were able to keep it together and in some respects thrive due to some aspects of remote teaching and working. Uh, we're coming to terms now with the cognitive, emotional, and physical burdens of living with high levels of uncertainty. It's no surprise that we're seeing lots of reports confirming that learners especially are feeling disconnected, rudderless, and hopeless. So how do we help learners re-engage and rediscover the joy of learning? How do we reconfigure our teaching and our classrooms in ways that promote well-being and that respect the humanity of our learners and of ourselves? Our keynote speaker is here to share some thoughts uh, on this timely topic. Ariana Cantu is lecturer in UW School of Social Work. Her 25 year journey in social work includes work in healthcare, housing, mental health, community organizing, environmental, racial, and social justice, and education. She hails from Burien, Washington, and fell in love with teaching while on a respite from direct social work practice. She's a UW alum, having earned two degrees in social work uh, from the Seattle campus. In 2021, Ariana received the Global Innovation in Curriculum Award and is also the 2022 Honors Community and Curriculum Innovation Scholar. Please help me welcome Ariana as she discusses Not Gonna Let the Elevator Bring Us Down, Strategies for Cultivating Collective Wellness. Thank you so much, Penn, and hello, colleagues. I'm really thrilled to be with you for your lunch hour. Um, as we begin in this Zoom space together, I'm really going to set a particular tone. And so um, I'll be playing some music to kind of welcome us into this space. And I invite you to dance with me to kind of move around seated, standing, um, however you feel most comfortable. Um, for those that are able, I invite you to turn your cameras on so we can see each other. Um, and kind of bringing this intention around the spirit of playfulness and joy um, as we open up in a learning space together. So here we go. All right, thanks for getting this kicked off well. Are people feeling warm yet? Good, good. Um, I'm gonna share screen with you. Hold on, let me plug all this tech in. And thumbs up if folks can see these slides. Yeah, you're good? Perfect. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be together today. I know that everyone is uh, overwhelmed to say the least, um, but I think it's really important to get together for our collective learning. So I'm really glad to be with you here um, to talk about the ways that we can bring in strategies for wellness into our teaching practice. Um, again, my name is Ariana Cantu. I use she, her, ea pronouns. I have dark brown hair, long, uh, straight brown hair and eyes, brown eyes. I'm wearing glasses with kind of black formed rim at the top. Um, I'm a light-skinned Chicana. I have on a yellow uh, kind of linen shirt, collared shirt. Um, and I teach in several departments actually at the UW. I teach uh, primarily in the School of Social Work, but I also now teach um, in the Honors Department um, and I teach um, as adjunct faculty in the College of Built Environments. Um, additionally, I work in community here and I have been working in uh, the city of Seattle and King County doing equity and justice work, um, something that I feel like is really integral to wellness. And this is a dark blue background slide with white text that reads strategies for cultivating wellness. And in lime green text below it is my name, uh, my degree. I have my uh, master's in social work um, as well as my affiliation for the UW, today's date and uh, my email address. So I encourage y'all to get in touch with me. I think uh, Wei and uh, others can put that in the chat. Um, I am deeply, deeply, uh, thoughtful about the ways in which we can be in the present moment together. 
And I care about wellness so much because uh, not only myself, but my ancestors have been suffering for a very long time. Um, and I know really that there's just a path towards healing and healthier ways of being around each other if we can slow down, if we can ground ourselves. Uh, this slide is a photo of the forest floor, uh, very green Pacific Northwest with some uh, tree limbs in the center and there's uh, you know, a path of light coming through uh, on the right hand side. Um, and the text in white says grounding um, slash land acknowledgement. Uh, this slide is again dark blue in background um, with an aqua and green map on the left hand side uh, that locates the 66 Coast Salish nations listed in numerical order on a map that corresponds to the western coastline of uh, Washington state. Um, the map is actually from uh, native-land.ca. It's a great resource for us as individuals, um, but I always also start with honoring the land. Um, I do this in particular um, to acknowledge what came before me, um, but also to accept my own role as an occupier of space. Um, and particularly uh, as a member of a predominantly white institution that is built on um, the taking of Duwamish land and natural resources. Um, I also use this a lot as a strategy to kind of frame the ways that we can heal and begin to be in right relationship with indigenous communities that we are a part of. Um, I'm really also um, honored um, to be on Suquamish land today. I'm in Kitsap County, uh, Peninsula um, and I also uh, use this as an opportunity to uh, call on my ancestors, the Huasteks, who uh, are the indigenous people of what is now called San Luis Potosi in Mexico for the lineage that I carry forward. Um, this is my birthplace. Uh, as Penn mentioned, I was born um, in Burien. And um, just show of, of hands here, how many folks are in South King County? Is anyone in South King County right now? Just wanna take a look. No, we all uh, got Megan. Yes, yes, nice, nice, representing. Um, so as you'll see on some of the slides, yes, Melissa, I see you, South King County. Um, as you'll see on some of the slides, uh, I'll be asking you to participate in the chat as a way to engage. I think it's really important to hear from you. Um, and so I'd love to have you use the chat right now and type the name of indigenous peoples of the land that you're occupying today. I just would love to see where everyone's at right now. Um, I, uh, I come um, also to, to really um, appreciate the fact that beyond a land acknowledgement, it's important to have action in our, um, in our honoring of, of uh, the collection of wisdom that is here uh, that we benefit from 66 uh, nations here, right? Um, and so um, in yellow at the very bottom of this slide is a link to donate to Real Rent, Rent Duwamish um, and the Suquamish Foundation. If you haven't already, uh, if you work and you generate income um, on this land, then check out uh, both of these websites where you can actually donate for that occupancy. Um, this slide is again a picture of the forest floor. I'm going for a PNW, Pacific Northwest theme here. Uh, this is a darkly shadowed image of the forest floor um, with uh, thick dug fir tree trunks in the foreground and kind of daylight again shining through. Um, I'm actually I'm going to give us some context. So in white uh, text, uh, there is uh, the, the words are context. Um, I think context is important. And the other thing is I never wanna assume that we all know the same things, right? Um, so I'm gonna give us some context and then I'm gonna give us some time to consider uh, some of the strategies that we can learn from each other, um, some of the strategies that I can share uh, around my work on campus um, and in communities. And there's gonna be times where I um, will ask you to engage or participate again via the chat. Um, there will be time for breakout as well. I really think it's important um, as we come together that you have the opportunity to learn from one another and engage with each other. Um, and that will give me a water break as well. Um, and then I'll share specific examples for, uh, for you. Um, but as we move into uh, context, um, I wanted to share with you some, some data, some information. Um, so this is a dark blue slide again in background with the white text on the right that says Husky check-in for fall of 2021. Um, and there is a side-by-side -side image on the left-hand side 
uh, of Kermit the Frog. We see on the far left, uh, March 2020, uh, a forlorn Kermit with his hand on the window. Um, in March of 2021, uh, there is the same image of a forlorn Kermit with the hand on the window, uh, a little bit rounder around the belly. Um, some of us can relate to that. Um, and just thanks to Sean Gerke and the team at the Office of Educational Assessment who conducted two surveys of both graduate and undergraduates in the fall of 2021, specifically looking at student wellness. And um, what I always find interesting about the data is that it really just confirms what many of us see in the classroom, right? Um, uh, again, you'll see a link to this source, and I believe they'll be able to put that in the chat for you, uh, for those that are interested. But we see that tremendous amounts of our students are experiencing mental health challenges. Uh, we know that additionally, work responsibilities or job loss was a huge weight for people to carry, and people are struggling financially. So um, when you link to the full report, you, uh, you'll you also see um, how important it is to kind of uh, disaggregate by race. And we know, and we know nationally, um, that Black Indigenous people of color are seeing uh, much more drastic levels of disparity in these areas. And um, what I also found interesting was that um, the amount of days and the amount of weeks in a month that students really noted that they were struggling were pretty high. Um, most students were saying that um, at least six days or more, they were having pretty severe mental health challenges, and um, those would last for up to four weeks, four weeks at a time. We also know, this is a slide, um, with a blue background uh, on the uh, right hand side it says every day i'm hustling and on the left is a, a cartoon black and white image of a hamster uh, moving through the wheel with wide eyes this is by uh, the cartoonist connie j sun um, we know that in the last two years this has been something that folks are feeling just again show of hands like how many folks are feeling like the hamster on the wheel yes i see you i see you Thank you, Tika. Thank you, Reed. Yes, yes, yes. Courtney, Colleen, Ryan. Yeah, right. Like this is something that we really uh, have become familiar with. And um, what strikes me though is, uh, keep your hand up if this was if this was the feeling that you were having before two years ago, before the pandemic. Um, what we know is that we live a hurried existence. That's really the truth. And over long periods of time, pre-pandemic, there's been tremendous amounts of stress, anxiety, and just great kind of difficulty of coping with um, the way in which we set a pace in our life. Um, and what we're seeing now kind of nationally is, uh, you know, in uh, last fall, November of 2021, 4.5 million workers quit their jobs. Like this is the reality kind of born of this spirit every day i'm hustling every day i'm hustling it's not sustainable we know it's not sustainable and yet we um we still are showing up um and what i find interesting when i look at the data of who has left their jobs more than half of people are saying they're leaving because they're feeling burnt out and they actually feel like they can't be themselves in their work environment they can't be their like true authentic selves in their work environment how horrible, how horrible is that? These are two photos side by side, again, on a dark black blue background. Um, the photo on the left is uh, of a young black man uh, with a mask on who's kneeling in a sea of flowers um, and balloons. He's holding a white sign with black uh, ink that says Black Lives Matters uh, with a, a, a black fist in the center um, and justice for Floyd at the bottom. And uh, he kneels below a graffiti mural uh, that was uh, painted by artist Cadix Herrera, uh, Greta McLean, and Zena Goldman outside of Cup Foods in uh, Minneapolis. The mural is of George Floyd, um, whose name is colored in orange in the background. Um, and then behind uh, his image is a, a sunflower that's coming out of his, uh, his background. And um, in the sunflower, it says, say our names at the top. And then there's a list of the black men and women, um, many trans uh, identified folks who have died at the hands of police. Uh, 
The second photo on the right is from uh, the representation project. Uh, it's of two uh, Asian uh, women with black masks on and black jackets. Um, they're holding cardboard signs that say hashtag hate is a virus um, and hashtag stop Asian hate. So uh, at the bottom here, it says coupled with the legacy of racism, it is no wonder, it is no wonder people are at their breaking points. And when I see this in my day-to-day -day life, and when many of us are seeing this um, in uh, our coworkers, in our colleagues, in our students, um, I wonder to myself, what can we do? What can we do, right, to address all of this? Well, the good news is, is there's plenty we can do. Uh, this is an image, kind of an upshot photo of a dark green pine forest. Uh, I love, I love coming from the Pacific Northwest, so healing. Um, there's daylight shining through this grove of trees and kind of moss colored, covered uh, grounds. Um, the text in white reads strategies for wellness. Um, one of my great uh, greatest teachers, Desmond Tutu, he says, what do we do in times of great despair? Uh, we show our humanity. And so um, what I will share with you today is really not going to be a checklist. I think checklists um, are not helpful because we each have our own kind of recipe um, and that's the beauty of how, what we bring into the classroom. So my hope really in coming together today is that uh, we have the opportunity to share. I'll share some strategies that I feel like have strengthened my approach for wellness for myself and others um, in the classroom. Um, I'll also share strategies that I've gotten from great teachers and collaborators and colleagues um, who I'll name as references for you in the slides. Um, and then others I want you to consider as we go through, how can you adapt this to your own flavor and really um, use it in your own practice as a way to bring in yourself. Um, I also want to give a shout out to my students. So I checked this list with them um, because they um, most often are my audience and likely uh, they're always the ones who know best what's effective in terms of the strategies for their wellness. So thank you students for uh, double checking my work here. This is a, a dark blue uh, slide with white text on the top that says our roles in the present moment um, on the right is a black and white image of James Baldwin wearing a white uh, collared shirt, a tie, uh, black tie and a suit coat. Um, and the quote on the left in white text reads, the paradox of education is precisely this. That is one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. Mm. Wisdom, James Baldwin. And I think uh, I wanted to share this because I really truly believe that our respective roles as members of this institution kind of places us in this unique space with students where we can um, bring in the ever-changing moment as a way to help students wrestle with all of these questions that they're struggling with, um, how to be effective um, in this moment, how to bring meaningful contribution into uh, the greater whole, right? Um, and I know that students are struggling with this in heightened context, but I think that it's really important as educators that we contextualize this moment in racism, in xenophobia, in the challenges of a global pandemic, um, all of the class and political divisions that we see and how that actually impacts our professional practice in the changing world. I think that as, um, as champions in the academy of critical thinking, that um, oftentimes we tend to avoid the topic of wellness in the classroom and in our curriculum, but I actually think it's such a fundamental part of cognitive development for effectiveness. And so how we show up really matters. It really matters. Um, and I think reminding us of our consciousness and frankly, our responsibility to examine um, and be actionable in ways is really, really key here. So here's the first strategy. Uh, we participated in this already. Um, this is a dark blue slide, the text in white at the very top left reads strategy one, setting the tone. Um, below the text is a picture of 
um, Prince's Let's Go Crazy single. Um, Prince is uh, also wearing a white collared shirt, pop, collar popped, uh, sitting on a purple motorcycle um, with the fog in the background in a staircase with Apollonia, his then muse, um, in, a, in a lit stairway. Um, so I want to actually circle back to the beginning where I invited folks to dance. Um, in lime green, you'll see um, a chat activity. Um, and so I'm going to ask you uh, to, to share in the chat, if you would, when I invited you to dance, how did that make you feel? I'm going um, to check out the chat here as we, yes, self-conscious, yes, yes. Liberated, love it. Vulnerable, everyone can see me. Yes, I did not feel excited to dance. Thank you, Gregory. Yes, yes, absolutely. Two left feet, thank you so much. Vulnerable and visible. Yes, also fun. Silly, yeah. So much, um, so much surprise, good. I'm glad I could catch you off guard a little bit. Didn't do it, wasn't part of my, <laughs> yes. Okay, got you, yes. Um, and some folks don't participate. Relaxed, energetic, yeah, tired. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you for that. Um, so music is one strategy that I really use. And I'll give you some context in terms of why. That is really directly centered around my Latinx culture, uh, my queerness, my upbringing, my ancestors. Um, I was thinking about like the first person who invited me to dance. Usually it was my mother. Um, trying to like drag me out of my bedroom um, and connect with me, right? Um, and really dancing is something that makes me feel connected to other people. It is uh, grounding me in joy. It's grounding me in discomfort at times, um, but also kind of embracing um, energy that's not as, um, not as serious in tone. Um, I think, you know, um, I, I hearken back to um, when learning was fun um, and when we brought playfulness and joy into learning as young people. And I think we lose that so much over time as adults. Um, and so really um, for me, music and kind of setting this tone is an opportunity and a strategy to build relationships with students and kind of help them also become self-aware. Usually when I actually do this in the first class, I only have maybe one or two students uh, that join me. And um, each time I do it, more and more students join in. Um, because after all, we actually need time to feel safe with each other. We need time to just be. Um, we need time to build those connections. And some of us will get really stuck in what you, what you all just called out in the chat, which is uh, self-conscious, feeling like you're going to do it wrong, which is a huge proponent of academia that we need to break. Um, and really remember, right, so much of this great resignation that we're seeing is happening because people feel like they can't be them, their full selves in a place. How awful, how awful. Um, this is also a practice that I borrow from um, Brene Brown, uh, Brene Brown who um, teaches uh, Dare to Lead um, and really um, uses this as a strategy, asking people to dance and then having them reflect, reflect on why they are participating or not. Um, is really um, because when you can help people identify what leads to fear of public action, like dancing, um, oftentimes it's the same thread that stops people from showing up in other ways. Um, and particularly as I um, am working and, and collaborating and educating folks around how we, uh, how we disrupt and dismantle uh, systems of oppression, I need people to show up in action. And so this is a tool. Um, it really can be, I believe, a universal connector. And I also think it's important um, to help set context. So much music that we have um, in this moment that's being created and that has been created over time really provides kind of historical fodder for reinforcing some of our um, objectives in the classroom. And I think learning is all about discovery and kind of making connections. And so um, this is one of the ways that I do that. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is kind of bringing in the truth of the moment. 
Um, this is a dark blue slide uh, with uh, uh, white text on the right that says, what's the T question mark? Um, and the image on the left is a gray piece of paper with uh, uh, that's ripped out and uh, kind of unveils the word truth underneath. Um, and the reality is that these are real heavy times. Um, they're riddled with lots of false information um, and uncertainty and students are looking for the T. They are looking for the T. And one major T uh, is impacting us in this moment um, is white supremacy culture. Um, so this is a, a top shot of uh, a um, pine forest, a hemlock forest. Um, and there's a kind of intersecting dirt road with two paths in the middle. Um, the text in white reads, white supremacy culture, the air that we breathe. Um, so I wanna be also clear, not just my um, black indigenous people of color students, but most students at this point are aware of racism in North America um, and are, uh, are being taught in various formats around kind of the history of um, and what has really led to this moment. Um, and I think that talking about that and incorporating that should be part of our curriculum. So uh, I also use uh, some resources that I think are, are incredibly powerful and have been around for a long time. This is a dark blue slide again with white text that reads uh, white supremacy culture and institutions. Um, this is from the seminal work of Tema Okun and Kenneth Jones. Um, and here are two examples from their work um, that I use as class readings. Um, they also have a website that they've produced that has incredible resources. Again, that will be available to you in the chat. Um, but they notice really that um, they, they kind of have named and looked at uh, some of the typical uh, cultural aspects of white supremacy culture that are used as kind of norms and standards to inhibit people's behavior to be variant and really maintain kind of power and control for white people um, and white institutions. And, and the thing about culture that's so pervasive is oftentimes it's really hard for us to identify. And um, what, I, what I use this for is to allow students to really understand that these types of characteristics, characteristics that I have, that many of us uh, adopt, that they're really damaging because they uh, really um, aren't named, but they're operating all the time in our environments. And they are, I make it clear, they are really damaging to, to BIPOC folks, but they're also damaging to white people. We read this article and then we kind of go over how do these aspects of culture, white supremacy culture, how do those show up in students' um, expectations of themselves and others in academia? Um, how does this show up in their professional practice when they're out at their uh, field sites or they're working their very first job or they're collaborating with um, communities on a project as representatives of the University of Washington? I have them do kind of self reflection uh, assignments to notice how this is coming up. Um, and I also have them work around how this is being named and identified and shifted in the teams and the collaborative work that they do um, on projects. And then we, we use the strategies that the authors have, have offered as ways to kind of combat and shift out of that. So two major common ones that I think students really gravitate towards are um, perfectionism. Um, I don't know, again, show of hands, anyone guilty of perfectionism <laughs> like all the time, particularly in our, uh, in our work environment? Right, uh, there's no room for error. Um, there's really common practice to point out inadequacies, um, strengths um, and little, there's there's no, no room for kind of talking about strengths and, and little room for reflection, right? Um, and then this thing about around either or thinking that something is either good or bad, right or wrong, um, with us or against us. We see this, right? We see this in not just ourselves, we see this in our institutions. Do we also see this globally happening, right? Where people just can't see through the complexity. Uh, this is a dark blue uh, slide with uh, white text that says readings. Uh, we love we love assigning readings, right? And I think um, intentionality around some of the readings that we assign is really important. 
Um, so in white text below, it, it reads pre-pandemic trends of stress, anxiety, and depression. And then there's a quote from this book um, that says, these days people seem to be perpetually gearing themselves up for the epic battle of merely existing. Amanda um, Petrusich, um, who's a journalist and an author. Um, we know, studies have shown, that uh, personal overwhelm, relationship and family overwhelm, community and society overwhelm is upon us and has been upon us for a very long, long time. Um, and what I love about um, this book from um, Laura Vander Newt Lipsky, who's one of my great teachers and mentors, um, is that it really provides a framework and kind of understanding of what is in our collective control versus what's in our individual control and kind of trying to help students acknowledge those, those particular dynamics. So I use several of the readings from this book um, to kind of set some context in the classroom and allow for discussion, um, but also to give time for uh, employing some wellness strategies. Um, and I layer this in, in terms of connecting it to uh, white supremacy culture and kind of the toxicity that comes out of the, these um, these moments when we're not addressing um, our long-term stress, anxiety, and depression. Um, strategy two um, is all about highlighting indigenous wisdom and contributions. So this is a dark blue slide. Um, on the left-hand side, there are two images uh, next to each other of uh, books. Um, uh, on the far left is a tan cover with a green braid in the center. Um, it's the book um, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants from um, the incomparable Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, tremendous book. It's actually the common book for the UW this year, I believe. Um, and uh, the book on the right is a, um, it, there's an image of kind of cl a cloudy sky with uh, with dirt in the foreground and then and then uh, the American flag, a bit of an image of the American flag on the ground and the text uh, for the title is an indigenous people's history of the United States for young people by um, the tremendously wise Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Um, I really value the tremendous wisdom that our indigenous community members and elders and leaders um, have given us and continue to give us. And I think it's really important um, in terms of grounding so much of my framing as an instructor. Um, you notice that we started uh, Beyond the Music with a land acknowledgement. Um, and um, I think that land acknowledgements can be performative in some ways at this point. It's like everybody wants to do a land acknowledgement, but I think having some intentionality around it is key. Um, so this is a dark blue slide with white text that reads land acknowledgement. Um, and this is actually text from uh, Glenn Stellmacher, who is part-time um, faculty uh, in architecture um, and adjunct faculty in the College of Built Environments. Um, when I was talking to some of my colleagues about land acknowledgements, um, what really stood out for me was um, leaders like Ken Yoakum, who is the associate professor and chair of landscape architecture. Um, uh, Ken really tailors every single land acknowledgement to each event and audience that he is a part of. Um, and, and I really think that that's so instructive in terms of moving past the performative. Um, when I talked to him about his process, he also noted that um, what he's actually learned comes from engaging directly with uh, Duwamish tribal services, with other uh, leaders, and naming trauma, naming the harm that has been caused um, and continues to be caused by, um, by our history, by this institution in particular. Um, this is uh, uh, some some of the notes from the meeting minutes of the architecture faculty from a few weeks ago. So thanks, Glenn, um, for um, sharing an example. Um, and beyond that, I also really see intentional efforts to kind of build relationships with um, indigenous practitioners, indigenous leadership. Um, I participated in a, in a studio that um, I think plans to be ongoing in the College of Built Environments where there were 10 instructors and um, Duwamish Tribal Services was our community um, partner and really worked um, to help students understand responsibility and kind of being in right relationship. Um, and the text here 
uh, quickly reads, in 1851, 12 adults and 12 children of the Denny party arrived at Alki and were quickly surrounded by encampments of over a thousand Indians. Um, 10 years later, a gift of land from Charles Terry of the original Denny party and others allowed a new territorial university to be established in Seattle. As of 2018, the same tract of land dubbed the Metropolitan Tract provides over 46 million in rental income to the UW each year, and the total assets within this tract are valued at uh, over 190 million. This total valuation has since increased significantly um, with the new NBBJ designed Rainier Square Tower. What is problematic is how this land was got by Charles Terry in the first place. As the first president of the Seattle Board of Trustees, Terry passed an ethnic cleansing ordinance on February 7th, 1865. History, right? History. Another practice uh, hearkening to long long-standing wisdom um, that I use is Shinrin-yoku. Um, so this slide again is an image of the forest floor of deciduous trees with that, um, that sunlight streaming through. And this is an image of our beautiful Olympic mountains uh, with a full moon rising over them. Um, the text on the lower right uh, in white reads, I am the land, the land is me. Um, one of the ways that I feel like we can stay engaged in kind of long-term wellness practice is to cultivate um, this acknowledgement of history and contextualize it around complexity, um, around humility, uh, around kind of countering settler colonial culture. Um, so this is from the wisdom of Dr. Karina Walters, uh, who is co-director of ERI, the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute. Um, I actually have students go outside. Um, Shinrin uh, Yoku translates to forest bathing in Japanese. And I have students go outside and repeat this mantra um, in nature physically. And sometimes I take classes to the Center for Urban Horticulture. Um, I ask them to do seemingly simple things like spend 10 minutes to find spring, uh, but anything really to get them outside of our classroom walls. And this is something that I really learned during the pandemic was how can we get outside? How can we breathe? How can we reset our kind of minds and be prepared, really prepared for absorbing learning in the moment. Um, sometimes this takes 60 seconds. Sometimes um, we spend all day outside and I don't rely on my slides, right? Or my lecture notes. Um, but I think really contextualizing how different this mantra is versus the colonial thinking, I own the land, the land is mine, is important. And I think indigenous communities also remind us that the land heals us and land-based wisdom um, really has uh, tremendous, tremendous things to teach us. So um, I have them pause while they're outside and have them kind of consider how differently can you um, enact your roles, your professional practice with this awareness and this sentiment in mind, right? Um, this uh, is a dark blue slide with um, uh, white uh, text on the right that reads strategy three, um, the concept uh, of interbeing. And there is a black and white photo that always makes me smile. Um, on the left of Thich Nhat Hanh, again, just tr a tremendous uh, teacher, uh, someone I've learned so much from. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, for those that don't know, is a Vietnamese monk um, wearing, uh, in this image, black pants, um, some clogs, a long white shirt, White shirts are a thing. Um, I'm seeing the thread through. Um, he's carrying a hat in his uh, left hand and a large sunflower in his right hand as he walks through a grassy field with trees in the background and he is smiling wide. Um, I believe that uh, almost all of my practices are grounded in the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, and so I wanted to share with you this quote that says, interbeing is the understanding that nothing exists separately from anything else. We're all interconnected. By taking care of another person, you take care of yourself. And by taking care of yourself, you take care of another person. Happiness and safety are not individual matters. If you suffer, I suffer. If you are not safe, I am not safe. If you can smile, I can smile too. 
um, the understanding of inner being is very important. It helps us to remove the illusion of loneliness and transfer the anger that comes from the feeling of separation. Whew, power. Um, and Penn mentioned earlier, uh, last year, I got the opportunity to become a global innovation scholar. And I wanted to share with you um, some of the teaching and, and practice I've got in collaboration for that project. This is a dark blue slide with white text that says transnational teaching uh, opportunities. And um, this is a picture on the right hand side of my colleague, Dr. Dumba Kamwanya um, from the University of Namibia. Um, he's an Angolan Namibian man who uh, has a white goatee. Uh, he's wearing a kind of dark gray heather shirt. Um, and the quote that he uh, gave reads, um, globalization has connected us. We are all global village in politics, the environment, so many aspects. We are not isolated islands, environmental issues, poverty, war, all impact us at different scales. It's important for us to teach students that this interconnectedness is crucial for us to engage in as we learn to address the complex social forces affecting communities, affecting all of us really. Um, so my colleague Dumba um, and I, we work with students together in Namibia and in um, the Seattle campus. Stand concepts um, from indigenous practice like Ubuntu that really is the spirit of interconnectedness. It is understanding the ways that we can hearken back to old wisdom. And I think we've seen that a lot in the pandemic. We see that with mutual aid societies. We see that with communities coming together. Um, and using the context of this kind of global exchange provides an opportunity for students to connect theories uh, around um, interconnectedness, around uh, concepts of Ubuntu, concepts of kinship care, um, and really understanding the benefits that come from forefronting those connections. Because this is our reality. Uh, this is a dark blue slide. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, there's quotes that say, I, I can't breathe in uh, white text. And on the left uh, is a cartoon image of um, RCA artist, Her. Um, she's a black and Filipina R&B singer with thick black hair uh, with a kind of gray slices in the corners. Um, she's wearing sunglasses and hoop earrings. Shout out to hoop earrings. Um, she's holding a white sign that says, I can't breathe in black letters. And the image of kind of a plum colored cityscape is behind her uh, with clouds. Um, this song, it actually won the Grammy um, last year for Song of the Year, pays tributes to victims of uh, police brutality. And um, the context in this moment is that this is our reality. Um, this is many of our students' reality, and uh, many of us, including our students, are not safe uh, to be out in the world. That's heartbreaking. Um, if we use this framing of interbeing to acknowledge that our students are not safe, then that means that we aren't safe, right? That I too am not safe. And that is motivation to do something. That is motivation for us all to do something, right? And there's so much we can do. I really want to give shout out to um, a tremendous resource that we all have available to us on campus, uh, which is the Wellbeing for Life and Learning Collaborative. Um, so this is a dark blue slide with white text on the right hand side that reads uh, strategy for making wellness an assignment. Here's a photo on the left of the cover of the Wellbeing for Life and Learning guidebook um, here at the UW. Uh, this was a tremendous collective effort led by uh, Megan Kennedy, director of the Resilience Lab, uh, students, so many faculty from across different areas. And um, what I learned through these engagements is that there's so many colleagues who are practicing. I hope that many of you, and I'm excited to hear from you all, uh, are practicing. And I think the more that we can come together to share these strategies and really infuse them in the curriculum, um, they benefit not just students, they benefit all of us. Um, in the chat, we'll put a link to this PDF um, for you as a resource. Um, but I do wanna give you some time um, to break out with each other. Um, and so I'm gonna ask you um, 
to introduce yourselves. Um, and then you'll have uh, about seven minutes or so to um, share what's kind of a daily practice that you employ to strive for wellness. And how are you teaching that? Um, or is there another practice that you might be teaching in the classroom with each other? So I think we're teed up for you to be out in your breakouts. Um, so I'd love to have you, I would love to have like such a long conversation about all the things that you shared with each other, um, but I want to be mindful of time. Um, and so if you would, I would love to have you um, share in the chat just things that you're like, yes, this is the thing that I do. And I try to share that with students or, um, or something that you heard from a colleague that was really powerful for you. Um, <clears throat> as I end, I would be remiss if I didn't um, give you the final strategy, which is advocacy. Um, I think we all have a role to play in asking for what we need, particularly in this moment. This is a dark blue slide on the left hand side. This is ask for what you need in white text. Um, there's kind of hands holding together um, in the background. Um, and uh, this is a major mantra I have uh, with students, with my colleagues, um, is really just ask for what you need. We don't do this often enough. I think we fall silent. Um, we don't name the elephants in the room and we participate in harm. Um, when we harm each other when we do that. So um, I um, want to give a huge shout out, I think they're in the room, um, to Lev Cunningham and uh, this partnership that uh, was has been created through the pandemic with uh, the schools of social work, uh, law, public health, dentistry, health sciences, and counseling center. This uh, ask around having a departmental uh, liaison counseling model was in the works pre-pandemic. Um, and uh, just tremendous advocacy from all of these different departments to ask for what they were feeling like they really needed, which was in-house counseling for our students. We can't play that role as educators. We're their teachers, but we should be able to link them to the resources that they have available. Um, in the slide, you'll see text that I'm happy to share um, that I send to students during the first or second week, um, as well as the sixth or seventh week when I'm noticing people like dip in attendance, when I'm noticing quality of work go down. Um, I think it's really incredible to be able to have kind of a warm pass off. Those are Lev's words, which is letting students know this is the person that you can connect with. This, these are the people in student services. That's tremendously useful. Um, so folks don't feel like they're struggling and they don't have uh, that warm pass off. So I'm just so grateful um, to all of my colleagues for all of the work that you are doing around wellness. Um, I know we only have a few minutes for Q&A, um, but um, I'm happy to follow up with folks if people want to hear more, learn more, um, if you want any resources from me. And um, I really think that there's just uh, tremendous things that we can do when we, we work together. We need each other at this point, um, if that's not clear. We all need each other. And so I'm glad to be with you um, in this work. Thank you, Ariana. We've just got a minute left. So I, we're gonna put Ariana's uh, email address in the chat. If you have questions, I'm sure she'd be thrilled to follow up with you. I, well, I don't wanna make that assumption, Ariana. You're okay with that? Excellent, good. Well, to kind of lead us out, um, I just wanna thank Ariana. Thank you so much. Lots to think about here. Um, this is just the start of our teaching and learning symposium. I invite everyone to join the presentation sessions coming up this afternoon. Um, there are going to be five concurrent sessions this afternoon. The first one begins at two. The last one will begin at four. They're 30 minutes long. Uh, and there are also a few asynchronous sessions that will be open until April 26th. And you can find the schedule and the links to all the presentations that are happening um, at this link that I'm just putting in chat. Um, before we head out to the presentations, I want to offer my sincere gratitude to everyone who uh, worked with us to review the presentation proposals that came in. Uh, uh, thank you to our keynote speaker, 
to all of our presenters that you'll engage this afternoon, and to our collaborators in UW Learning Technologies and UW Libraries. And a really special thanks to Vice Provost Phil Reed, whose deep commitment to uh, really improving the quality of the instruction at UW guides everything we do at the Center for Teaching and Learning. And finally, thanks uh, and lots of love to the Center for Teaching and Learning uh, group here, and particularly its symposium planning committee who put together everything you're gonna see today. They are a truly remarkable group of people. Uh, just a heads up, we're going to be pinging you with an email in the next couple of days um, for uh, your feedback on what you see, uh, what you just saw to, in, in the keynote speech, uh, and also what you'll see in the presentations. We're super keen to get your feedback so we can improve next year's symposium. So thank you everyone for coming. Have a great time at the symposium presentations this afternoon. Take care. <laughs>